uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for jo for joining this distinguished webinar series in AI and cybersecurity at the University of North Dakota campus. Uh, this week's speaker is uh, Dr. James Tanger. And uh, uh, Dr. James has consulted with governments and corporations worldwide about security, open source, and workforce development for over 25 years. Organizations include Northrop Grumman, Mandiant, the US Department of Defense, NIST, UK Royal Army, NCSA Thailand, UPS, and Japan Ministry of Defense, MITRE. You know, uh, that's a quite a mouthful. <laughs> Amazon Web <laughs> Services, US Department of State, Oxford University, and West Point. He is a member of the Forbes Technology Council and a long-term member of AFCA Cybersecurity Committee. He sits on ATARC Secure 5G and Cloud Security Working Groups and APIS IT Advisory Council. As chair of the C3, he leads a consortium of leading global cybersecurity certification bodies, which includes several of them. <laughs> James is an award-winning author, blogger, and educator. He has published technical titles with O'Reilly, McGraw, Hill, Elsevier, Linux, and RSA Journal, among many others. He is an in-demand public speaker and a thought leader with C-level executives around the world. In addition to his work in the IT industry, he has designed globally recognized education, certification, and badging programs in topics as diverse as cybersecurity analytics, Linux administration, cloud migration, kayaking, and British romantic literature. He's currently chief technology evangelist at ComTIA. And today's title of the talk is What Socrates, Bayes, and John Henry Can Teach Us About Cybersecurity. With extreme honor and great privilege to have you, Dr. James Tanger, to, uh, as part of this uh, webinar session. Thank you so much for accepting our uh, invite, and uh, we're excited for uh, for your talk. And uh, the floor is yours. You can start sharing the screen. Well, thank you so much, Prakash. I really appreciate it, and thank you, everyone. If you could uh, open up your Q and A question and answer window, that's where you can ask me questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, certainly, in the last few minutes of the presentation, uh, last say 15, 10, 15, or you can ask them as we go along. Tell me where you're joining in from. I'm curious. Uh, greetings from uh, Olympia, Washington. Uh, I should just say Seattle, Washington, because I don't think anybody really knows where Olympia is. Uh, but I think most everybody knows where Seattle is. We're going to talk today about what Socrates, uh, Bayes, and John Henry can tell us about cybersecurity. So if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, uh, I'm James Stanger. Thank you very much for the, uh, that introduction. Of, uh, I, I gave you too long an introduction. Sorry about that. Uh, but I've done a lot of work uh, in uh, the IT space, uh, uh, practically implementing stuff as well as education. Let's talk about the layers and foundations of AI. It, when, whenever people want to stampede, as I say, into artificial intelligence, okay, they they kind of just want to get in there and leapfrog their way. And one of the things that uh, lessons, if you don't remember anything else from the presentation, you have to have your foundations. You got to know where you're coming from when it comes to using AI and, and machine learning in any sort of useful way. So before we start talking about AI and spam filters or using AI with Ansible, you know, great hybrid approach. Before we start talking about, uh, say, what Microsoft's doing with all these things I'll be, I'll be hitting, I think it's really important to get into the foundations because there are many layers, right, before you can kind of take that journey and that gateway into using AI and machine learning properly when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, that's, uh, let's see, a picture I took this past January in Japan uh, while I was there talking to the ministry, their Ministry of Defense, for example, about cybersecurity. This is another picture I just recently took. Uh, it is of something in Utah, southern Utah, at the Parowan Gap. You can look for that. You can Google for that. The Parowan Gap. It's basically a whole bunch of uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, ancient writing. Okay. Well, what does this ancient writing have to do with artificial intelligence? Well, at the Parallel Gap, clearly, for whatever reason, maybe religious reasons, maybe for commerce reasons, whatever, but it was basically a technological nexus because there's, uh, you know, Paleolithic, you know, ancient writing there. Why would they have taken the time to write something in the middle of the desert where it's so hot, et cetera? Because I think these are organizations, these were organizations, right? A ancient Paiute Native Americans, for example, who needed to communicate and needed probably to do business, right? And that's what they were doing here. Okay. Well, and even if it was for religious reasons or what have you, this was their form of artificial intelligence. Okay. So this ancient writing really was their way 
to kind of take a, a leap forward and using technology. Let me explain. We are in, I would argue, about the fourth industrial revolution, depending on what part of the world you might be uh, living in, what part of the, uh, depending on the culture. Here's what I mean by that. The first industrial revolution, it involves steam power, the, the train, right? The steam locomotive, right? The steam engine on a ship. The second industrial revolution, mass production, the use of electricity and assembly lines. What's the avatar for that? The automobile. Third industrial revolution, the computer is the avatar for that, the information age, the space age, right? Automation, mass automation, right? Well, if we want to get into the fourth industrial revolution, this is where we do add artificial intelligence. So from a cybersecurity perspective, think about the ways that we have to secure all of these four revolutions, as it were, that are operative right now, okay? They're all operative. But it's basically with the cloud, with artificial intelligence, and the providing of context you could argue we're in the third to fourth industrial revolution. The, the, there are faces that you could associate with these revolutions. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who kind of brought us, in many ways, the modern steam application of technology, uh, shipping, uh, everything. You could argue he built modern Britain. Um, and more importantly, I suppose, the modern world. You have Mr. Toyota, who created Toyota. There's a face, right? Most people would say, Henry Ford, why not talk about Mr. Toyota? Linus Torvalds, or if you want Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, uh, that's fine. Uh, fourth Industrial Revolution, how about Manjula Talraja? These are the, the faces there. Now, I'm giving you this background here because I think it's really important before we got, you know, kind of go and talk about what we can do with artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, the big four foundations for what we're doing. So before we talk about Amazon SageMaker, for example, where we can deploy machine learning models at scale, that's AWS's you know, pitch, right? I think we have democratization, miniaturization, virtualization, and automation, the four shuns, right? Two think, right? And I'm talking about the idea of miniaturization, okay, first, or democratization. Um, everybody has a mobile phone. Uh, if you're the chosen one, you have uh, uh, an Android. If you have an iPhone, good for you, I guess. I feel for you. Uh, I'm kidding. But think of this. You are looking at a picture of my dad there standing in front of cutting-edge voice technology that was probably phasing its way out around the 1950s. That is how people recorded voice. That middle machine there is, uh, is how you listen. You listen to these little wax cylinders. The machine with the little horn coming out, that's what you talked into. So think of how we have miniaturized, right? And democratized. You know how expensive that stuff was back in the day to get a hold of, right? A lot of people now can get a hold of incredible voice video technology. Think of where we've changed, right? How things have changed. We can talk about host and cloud and serverless virtualization, but these are all trends that have been with us and the growing trends for over 300 years, okay? Let me give you a case in point. I had a tree fall down recently uh, uh, in my, uh, uh, in, in my I'll, I'll call it my yard. It's kind of a forested area out, out the back. Don't worry, I don't have a ton of acreage, but that fell there. Uh, um, and so I decided to chop it up and make firewood out of it. So I used good old fashioned kind of 19 to early 20th century technology. I lifted it up a little bit. I did get a chainsaw out, started bucking it up as they say, you know, cutting it up. Uh, and I was, you know, using this old technology, right, to make that happen. Well, my dad, who had recently had a stroke, said, well, James, why don't you take a step up in the world and do some automation? He didn't put it that way. He said, why don't you get a stump splitter? And he showed me how to do that, right? Dad's always showing me how to do things. And um, we got through a, about three cords of wood uh, in an afternoon. Okay. I'm just giving you an example about how somebody, and it was funny. The thing I want you to take away from this is not so much, hey, yeah, automation's fine. It's more, I had to understand how to cut down wood and had to, a, a tree and bucket up and everything and make sure that it was ready. I had to still understand the foundations of how to cut wood, but I brought automation into it. I like to think that I knew what I was doing, but automation sped it up. I think the first lesson when it comes to cybersecurity and artificial intelligence that I want to bring in at this point is if you don't have mature processes, if you don't have a foundation in cybersecurity, if, you, if you're not getting your, your IT and business purpose ducks in a row first, adding automation to something that's already chaos 
is going to just make for automated and AI chaos. All right. I, I just can't tell you how much uh, sometimes it's exciting for artificial intelligence to be with us and use it every day. And we have been using in the cybersecurity industry, using AI for over 30 years. And I'll explain that, what, uh, that statement. But I, I do think it's sometimes frustrating when I see people going, oh, yeah, we're going to use AI and it's going to solve all our problems. I don't think so. If you have lack of process maturity, if you don't really have a foundation in understanding the foundations of cybersecurity, you're going to be in an even worse mess if you throw AI into the mix. That's just the nature of it. OK, I'll move on. First, John Henry. I promised things about John Henry and Socrates, right? And Bayes, right? How they are going to teach us more about cybersecurity. Well, here's the first lesson. John Henry, if you know the legend, right? The legend of John Henry. It's a legend that came out of the south part of the United States. He was a steel driver. He was an expert. He got into a competition, if you remember the uh, the myth, right, with a steam drill. And he said, I can do that faster, right? Well, and he did win. Remember, at the very end, he won. He was actually able to beat the steam drill. Isn't that great? But then he died. Why did he die? Because he had to work so hard, right, to, to compete against that steam drill that even though he won just barely, it killed him. Okay, broke it, his heart and died as the folk song goes. So John Henry kind of, uh, people will say he was a, a, a living person. I would argue he's, uh, there's a living person around the late 1870s, that's fine, but a real myth came up. So the steam machine could drill, but it could not shake the chippings away. And this is very important. All right. So when a steam drill, a steel driver is doing things, right, it will go down in and drill a hole into the ground, into a rock, right? But did you know that to this day, it still pretty much requires a human being to take that drill and shake it laterally because all of the chipping, right, that a steam drill gets in there, the chipping, the stuff that's left behind, right, it sometimes doesn't exit properly and it binds the drill. So the lesson I want to learn here, that I want you to learn here from John Henry is choose your battles. Don't try to beat artificial intelligence or any form of automation by trying to beat its repetitive nature. Artificial intelligence is very good at automating the process of going through brute force kind of computing. When I say brute force, I'm not necessarily talking about brute force cybersecurity attacks. I'm talking about going through large amounts of repetitive data. AI automation will always be faster than human beings, but human beings still can think laterally, or you could use the term orthogonally, better than artificial intelligence. That's still the case, and it's going to be the case for some time. In other words, let artificial intelligence do the work that is repetitive, and let human beings do the work that is not repetitive, that requires kind of lateral thinking, to shake the drill laterally, right? Right? To shake things loose. Um, John Henry didn't know that. He did not do well with it, okay? He did not do well afterwards because he died. As human beings, we need to make sure that we let artificial intelligence do the job for cybersecurity. So there's some background there. Let me define a couple of terms here about artificial intelligence and a, a, and machine learning before we move on. So when it comes to artificial intelligence, I feel that it is a form of smart automation, right? That's, I think, a good practical way to look at it. It's the use of technology right, to automatically improve itself, right, to respond to situations, to communicate with other machines and other people, right? So I see automation as the larger category and we can talk about scripts or applications, uh, Docker, Kubernetes and orchestration, but artificial intelligence I see as part in there. Um, let me uh, do a further uh, definition by telling you a lame joke. Uh, what programming language folks is used for machine learning, right? Name it, right? What? R, Golang, Java, Python, right? That's a, Those are good machine learning machine learning languages. Uh, what language is used for, pro, uh, what programming language is used for artificial intelligence? PowerPoint slides. All right, there's my lame joke, right? Uh, in other words, so many times I have seen, and I've talked with people who, uh, worked with people who have working artificial intelligence. And sometimes it's awfully interesting uh, when they talk about AI, they have nothing more than vaporware. All right but I'm gonna bring you more than just vaporware here. And this picture here is of something that is an analogy I'm trying to draw here. That's a picture of a wall in London. The bottom part of that wall is literally Roman. The top part of the wall is literally medieval. Notice what's behind it, modern buildings, right? 
we have to have the right foundation before we move forward using artificial intelligence. Just want to emphasize that point. And part of that foundation, let's make sure we understand some of our lingo that we're using. AI is the ability really, you could argue, to mimic human behavior. Machine learning is applied AI. It allows an application to improve itself. That's what machine learning does. It's a machine that's able to uh, conditionally improve itself. Deep learning is the applied machine learning that it allows complex algorithms and neural nets to kind of continually train a model. I just want to go with these definitions here, right? And I think it's really important that as you look at AI to implement it, right, that you have your kind of terms in a row. So there's predictive and generative AI, right? Predictive AI, right, is kind of where it's at when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, for all the talk about chat GBT and BARD, I really think it's very important to, to understand predictive and generative AI. They have their place. One's not better than the other. There's no one better than the other. But predictive AI takes analog processes, uh, oops, automates them with very high levels of accuracy. And there's minimal human oversight. And it can anticipate and improve itself. The foundations for this have been set, as I was talking about, for hundreds of years. And I'll be talking about Bayes, B-A-Y-E-S, not Michael Bay, right? Uh, Bayes was a 18th century thinker, and I'll get into him in just a second. Uh, 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 and I'm not talking about Michael Bay, who makes movies for 18-year-olds. I'm talking about uh, a person named Bayes, and I'll, I'll explain it here. But there's predictive and then generative AI. And these are algorithms that are really used to create new content. Kind of adds a bit of how should I put it, randomness in there. It's kind of a random generator in there. That's chat, GPT, and BARD. All of these things have their place, but predictive AI is probably where I'm going. But let me make a couple of points here. I did a bit of ego surfing uh, on chat GPT. Check this out. And I said, who is James Stanger? That's my question. Pretty basic question. And I'm setting the foundation for the discussion of Socrates here in a minute. But And it says, well, here's James Stanger. He's been a tech uh, uh, and security expert. I, I, I've never liked that term, security expert. But for over 20 years, he's the chief technology evangelist at CompTIA, which is true. I do a lot of work getting the word out about CompTIA, mostly to hiring managers, to people who are CIOs, CISOs. And uh, there are some, some things there, and it's pretty accurate. I've written a lot of books, et cetera. But notice at the bottom there, it says that he has certifications, including CompTIA Security Plus, which I do, A Plus, which I do. And then it says ITIL, IDLE Foundation. Well, that's not the case. Never has. So I was very pleased to be awarded IDLE Foundation certificate, certificate status because I, I don't have that. Right. So this is my first lesson here about AI and security. We got to get our factual ducks in a row. And so I asked, well, which James Stanger are we talking about? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, you're confused. Uh, it's a relative. James Stanger is a relatively common name, which I'm, I'm not sure that's the case. Um, so he is the CTA at CompTIA. That's great. And he's published. So that's pretty good. And I said, no, James Stanger does not have a PhD. That's what um, ChatGPT said. Excuse me. Well, that's kind of funny because I do. Right. Uh, it says I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in International Studies from University of Washington. Well, uh, different James Stanger. I don't have an MBA. Right. Um, I don't have a CISSP is fine, but a CEH, I don't have that. So the facts of things are really important to understand when it comes to chat GPT or BARD or any form of AI. And this brings up some things here. This here is the Bayes algorithm. And if you want, you can Google for it right now. Uh, the person who invented that, he was a, a, a 18th century thinker. I think he lived from like 1701 to like the 1740s or 1760s. This algorithm has been in use for hundreds of years, right? It did not show up last year. ChatGPT didn't invent it. It goes way back. And there's a picture of the guy, right? Well, not his picture, it's a portrait. So... Why do we have a fascination with and dread of AI and, and machine learning when it comes to security? Let's talk about some root causes. That's a picture I took in Japan, actually, uh, of some root steps, right? Notice their steps up. Uh, I kind of like this, right? So we have problems with AI, you could argue, if you want to talk about the negative, that we ignore the garbage in, garbage out principle, right? So if you put bad stuff into something, you get bad stuff out. And I would argue with AI and machine learning, you put bad stuff in, you get worse stuff out. Sometimes we forget or don't care where our information comes from. Well, it came from artificial intelligence, so it must be true. Yeah, uh, that's a problem. 
right? And when it comes to cybersecurity, it's very important to think, to remember that. So tech as a mystery box, this is my way of saying a lot of people kind of treat it like, well, you just kind of throw it in there and it goes round and round and out comes magic. Well, we have to get past our magic worldview. There's a there's an old saying, right, that any sufficiently advanced form of technology is basically tantamount or equivalent to magic, right? Um, I think it's really important for us to use technology and get out of a magic worldview of it, okay? So this is where I'm going with cybersecurity. Um, you can't leave the work to someone else. Uh, you can leave the repetitive work to AI, yes, but the real last mile, the real truly unique contribution, that has to be from a human being still, right? Um, that'll be the case, I think, for a long time. And I'm just not trying to be defensive of human beings. Uh, that, that would be me trying to do the John Henry thing and, and resist progress. That's not what I'm talking about. So don't mistake authority for slick delivery or slick technology here. Okay. So the considerations, of course, we have to train our ML, AI, right? If you don't train it, it's like a child. It requires training. You need the right input and you need to have correction. OK, and we've seen examples that on the on the right hand here of your screen, you'll see um, you have all sorts of issues with training. So, you know, ChatGPT was uh, uh, it was uh, the information it has was from uncurated databases scraped from the Internet. That's all fine. They kind of stopped training at about 2021. But if you don't train your AI, you run into problems. For example, AI ran into uh, excuse me, AWS ran into AI training problems when it comes to uh, its uh, hiring and it showed uh, serious biases against women, for example, right? So what can you provide in the face of artificial intelligence? I think what you have to do, first of all, is you have to curate your technology, right? So before you talk about AI launching attacks or defending against attacks, let's make sure we train our artificial intelligence right. And this is very important to understand is that much of the AI that we see being used today in uh, cybersecurity tools, and it has been for years, it usually started somewhere else. And in other words, it was this artificial intelligence was created for another purpose usually. And then the cybersecurity industry has effectively purposed it for cybersecurity. Now that's, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you retrain it. Because computers, AI has a long memory and sometimes it will go back to its roots. OK, and so if that AI was created to do uh, searching through images or if that AI was recruited for an HR tool, but then they said, well, actually, we can use that, that automation and that thinking to uh, take a look at cybersecurity data sets, packet captures or log files. Um, sometimes that AI will uh, kind of go run home to mama, as it were. There's an old movie called Red Hat, uh, it's Red Hat, sorry, uh, Hunt for Red October. And in this old movie, uh, there was a person who knew that he had discovered a new submarine. It sounded like a new submarine, but the machine that he was using, AI, uh, said, well, no, that's just a volcano. It's just magma displacement. And he knew enough about that uh, artificial intelligence machine that when it was really uh, given some sort of really truly new kind of information that required lateral thinking, that the AI would go back to its roots because the roots of that AI was that it would go and search for seismic displacements and, and earthquakes and volcanoes. Well, he's like, no, we're not chasing a volcano. We're chasing a submarine. The human being was right. This is what I mean by doing the proper kind of training. And when it comes to issues of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, you have to iterate. Now, iteration is not just, hey, we'll do it tomorrow. That's that's procrastination. That's what I call cowboy IT. That's a mess. Iteration, proper iteration is very important when it comes to artificial intelligence because you have to iterate your way into a proper cybersecurity implementation. So let's not try to become the next version of John Henry, right? You know, what did he try to do? He tried to provide value in the wrong area. It's unique value and lateral thought, or they, as they call orthogonal thought. I would say orthogonal, sorry, orthogonal thought. In other words, the surprises. That's what the human beings are. So what can we do right now, right, with AI? Well, it's really good at analyzing data sets at scale. Uh, I was recently in Zion National Park where I was able to get a hold of some fossils. See this picture of uh, the, the little stars? Those are actually root stems that have been petrified, right? So they're fossils, right? And I just did that by hand. I grabbed a bunch of dirt and I was taught by my daughter-in-law to kind of go through the, the sand and look at that. I found these fossils, right? AI can do that far quicker than me. 
right? It can analyze data sets, pictures, voice conversations, video, music, and identify my voice far quicker than any human being. And it's incredibly good at it. And it can really do a fantastic job. It can accelerate brute force activities. But AI cannot fix the inability to think laterally and proactively. The startup moonshot mentality, I stole this from a from a really cool article I read uh, the other day. In other words, hey, let's uh, do something radically new and we don't care about what came before. That's kind of cool. It's very uh, human to do that. Um, I think it's very important to have the right foundation. So this idea, hey, we're going to do something radically unique and never done before, and who cares what went before? That's a problem. You know, you're trying to make a moonshot. Let's let's use AI as a lever, as a force multiplier. So uh, AI cannot fix poor processes, what I call technical debt or what is called technical debt. The idea that, well, let's implement some code or implement a solution and let's skip steps. And if you skip steps, you incur a debt. That's a problem, right? Shadow IT, the we need it yesterday syndrome. So we skip all sorts of steps. AI ain't going to fix that, okay? Because there's already those are already broken processes in the first, in the first place. Well, let's get into artificial uh, intelligence and industry strength AI and what that really means. So let's talk about a few things. First of all, I think it's really important instead of that moonshot mentality uh, of doing something you know so radically different, it's never been thought of before, and then it turns into AI as PowerPoint slides. Let's focus on AI as an improvement to existing technologies or best practices, one or the other. I suppose best practice is better than technology. So I'm talking about hybrid approaches and hybrid meaning an existing tech, and then you add AI to it and holy cow, you've got a really powerful lever now, a really powerful new form of miniaturization and virtualization, all those things that have been going on. All right. So let's consider how to use AI to improve existing processes, to automate automation or make it more clever, to think maybe a little laterally to improve creativity, right? And, and this is really important. It's a fancy word uh, to engage in a heuristic process. And by heuristic, I mean kind of back and forth. The idea of a heuristic process is, is that we iterate our way to improvement, okay? And I'm getting into that Socrates guy. So I've talked about uh, John Henry, I've talked about Bayes, right? And I've talked about, and I'll be talking about Socrates here in a minute. So hybrid solutions, they're important because they allow us to get past that moonshot mentality. They focus on AI as a force multiplier. I'm taking that from the milita US uh, military, uh, militaries worldwide. A force mil uh, multiplier is the idea that you use a technology to make one person or one group or a smaller group punch above its level or to operate above its level, or to, right? That's really what it's about. So you're improving existing technologies here. Case in point. So finally, we're getting to some practical stuff here. I just think it's really important to get those foundations first. Here's the naive Bayes um, uh, algorithm there. Do you see in the middle there? Uh, I've got the picture there. And do you see in the middle of this kind of eye chart of a, of a particular slide? You're looking at a, a common spam filter. So incoming email comes in and it gets spin or spun around, right? And that spinning means there's pre-processing and information extraction. And here's where the training takes place. This is something, folks, that's been going on for 30 years, okay? Spam filters have been around a long time. Obviously, they get better all the time. But they use, still to use, for the most part, the naive Bayes algorithm. So that funny mathematics there that's there, that algorithm has been working for a long time and keeping us secure, at least in terms of that layer, as it were, of, of email, right? So I just want to say that this is nothing new necessarily. It's really cool. But this is how we're using this. Let's see. I guess that's about 300-year-old, 200-year-old uh, algorithm, okay? So notice that we're using a hybrid model. We're taking existing email, the idea of filtering, but we're using AI there, right? So we've been using this in our spam filters for decades. So that's just one example. Another example is Ansible Lightspeed from Red Hat. Now you could argue, well, James, that's not necessarily a cybersecurity technology. I would argue actually it's awfully closely, awfully closely related. So basically what they've done is they've taken Ansible. And if you don't know what Ansible is, it's the ability to use scripts they call them playbooks, to do very sophisticated things. You could launch a thousand uh, ships, a thousand instances of the cloud, or uh, do some very interesting things with uh, Kubernetes, or you could do something more modest and um, using a script that's maybe a hundred lines or go, oh, what am I thinking? I suppose 20 lines long uh, update 
the patch level of a thousand Linux servers or Windows systems or what have you. Okay. Well, machine learning, they've combined that with IBM's Watson, because Red Hat's an IBM company, to supplement Ansible playbooks. So it automates automation. Isn't that cool? See, to me, this is something that's, I think, better than, oh, here's a really cool startup, which I'm sure there's a wonderful startup that's going to do great things, but kind of like, you know, grains of sand in your in your hand, one of those startups will work, right, out of the thousands that are, that are in your hand. I'd rather when it comes to cybersecurity, if I were recommending something to my boss about what we could do, I'd rather combine, it doesn't have to be Red Hat's thing, uh, it could be something, but the idea of combining working AI that's been around a long time with a working technology, that's one of my points. Threat emulation, I was, uh, 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 there was a presentation at a Black Hat a while back, it was back in, I think, 2018, where basically Microsoft uh, and, and some hackers basically came up with a supervised machine learning model I thought was pretty interesting to do threat emulation. And what they did is they had a, a group of experts in, in a room and then they had a computer, computer, they had an AI implementation from Azure going and they found that the automation, uh, you know, won out every time. It was able to do really good threat emulation about what was coming next. So what they did is they took Microsoft uh, Azure and they took uh, the idea of log analysis and, uh, and, and improved it. So when it comes to cybersecurity, the ability to improve the OODA loop. OODA loop, I think, was uh, sounds like a, an old 1950s song. But the OODA loop, uh, you know, observe, orient, decide, and act, right? O-O-D-A, right? This is a very important concept, not only to uh, uh, Air Force flyers or airplane flyers, that's where that concept started, or to the military, but it's a very important uh, thing that's going to be more and more automated when it comes to cybersecurity. So whether you're using Q radar or some sort of uh, 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 SIM tool or Splunk or what have you, it's the automation of this process. And the the intelligence being applied to this process is very important. I just wanted to bring that up. In the military, we're already seeing uh, 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 AI and machine learning used to perform strategic data analytics, and specifically on things such as images, as drones take images or video. Uh, AI has already been used for years to go through and identify anomalies because they could do it a lot faster than human beings. Also, they're doing it for combat si uh, simulation. I think you're going to see the same sort of thing moving forward in cybersecurity, where artificial intelligence won't do everything, but we will train it to help us to understand, okay, as you are in, quote unquote, combat, in some sort of adversarial relationship uh, with attackers, how can AI help model and emulate this based on the data sets? And this is a very important thing that, that I want to bring up. AI and what I call the interstice. That's a it's a term that's that's been around a long time, but I'm using it in a very specific way. And I'm talking about the idea of two things coming together, right? Working together, two different technologies. For example, SQL, SQL Server, right? Um, database server and a web server, right? Those two different technologies. When they come together, that's really where hackers love to go in and manipulate, you know, things like SQL injection attacks or whatever. So it's the concept of the interstice. That's me. I took that picture uh, just a couple of weeks ago at the Zion's National, Zion National Park um, going up the Narrows. And I just thought, you know, the Narrows are basically two different mountains that kind of, you could argue, kind of came together, or at least an area came together, the river cut a way through it. And so I want to talk more about this because we have to monitor and visualize and respond to these, the interstices, the interstices that show up in our lives and in, in our computing. AI and machine learning will be very important for handling this because we haven't been able to do a real good job manually, have we? If we had, we'd be at a level of maturity and a minimum viable level of cybersecurity that we just haven't been able to reach as an industry. Just haven't. AI to the rescue, mm, AI will help us. Okay. So I already talked about the web server and SQL server example, but just an interstice is, for example, whenever I get onto my phone and I'm checking my email or my IMs, right, from all my applications, that's an interstice where a human being, a brain, is inter is is connecting with a technology. You get the idea. So phishing happens. You have root shell attacks from API to API. You have sniffing and person in the middle attacks, PITM attacks. Uh, 
happy. So these places of conversions, they're kind of like the, the hard to brush places in your teeth. That's why we floss. You better floss. AI will help us floss better, okay? Because it will implement Lockhart's exchange principle much faster. Lockhart, uh, another old person, uh, I think he died right around the time when I was born. And his whole thing was uh, that a perpetrator, a bad actor, will bring something to the crime and then leave something behind. Pretty modest point, I guess. Not really. It was utterly brilliant. Uh, not only did it make television shows like Columbo possible or whatever murder mystery you like to show, look at, it made forensics possible. So fingerprints left behind, DNA left behind, things like that. Well, it's the same sort of thing with cybersecurity. We've been looking for indicators of attack and indicators of compromise. And we've been doing it using some forms of, of artificial intelligence. We know about hacker life cycles, or at least we have some pretty good models out there, right? Here's the Lockheed Martin cybersecurity. Here's the MITRE attack model. You know, these, these models. Imagine being able to train AI properly with these models. And this is one, the diamond model, which has been used traditionally anyway uh, to train artificial intelligence, to basically say, here's the adversary's capability, here's the victim's capability or victim's infrastructure, and how can we triangulate our way in? These are the ways that we can kind of take a look at the tactics, the techniques, and the procedures and automate that process. Let me give you an example. I was recently talking to a, a friend of mine, works for... Uh, in uh, Tesco, uh, which is a, a, a retail company. And they're very interested in looking into HTTP traffic. And they're using artificial intelligence specifically to identify the dialects of HTTP. I think all of us have heard accents before, right? Uh, there are different Spanish accents. There are different English accents, right? It's, it's all the same language. Well, when it comes to HTTP, every web browser, every operating system, right? kind of has its own dialect of HTTP. Well, hackers love to em emulate that and, and imitate that. They use artificial intelligence to make it as, uh, how should I put this? To make it as sophisticated as possible so that their command and control traffic, their data transfer mimics legitimate HTTP. They're using artificial intelligence, specifically the naive Bayes algorithm to see if they can quickly identify bad uses uh, or, or different HTTP traffic that the hackers hand roll. That's the term that this person uh, that I know uses. So this is HTTP that has been created. That's illegitimate traffic, but it looks so good that most of your Zeke, your Suricata, your Snort, all those intrusion detection systems don't pick up very easily. You have to train them better, right? Well, AI is able to kind of find a lot of that better if you train it right. So it's been interesting to see them apply AI in a way to go after these threat actors. So I just wanted to uh, bring that up. Now, here are a few insights before we go into maybe some questions here. That's a picture I took, uh, that was in Japan, uh, on, on top of the Tokyo Tower. Uh, sorry, yeah, the Tokyo Sky Tree. Tokyo Tower was built in the 50s. The Tokyo Sky Tree, I think, was built 10 years ago. A uh, huge thing. It's uh, It basically allows visibility all around Tokyo, but even more importantly, it, it allows all of the... Uh, um, mobile connections, cell tower, uh, cloud connections, et cetera, through uh, most of Tokyo. All right, so let's see what we can talk about. One of the first things I think is really important is that, and this is where the Socrates stuff comes in, is that we have to figure out how we work and play well with our artificial intelligence coworkers or friends. We need to figure out specifically, and success will be where we kind of focus in on that interstice area where AI and machine learning leave, leave off and where humans begin, all right? So basically success resides in the dialogue. And this is where I'm talking about the Socratic method, okay? Socrates, uh, what, three, 400, 400 BC, right, BCE? The more we understand the AI and human interaction, the interstice, right? the more we'll succeed. And I'm talking kind of about the 80-20 rule. And I'm going to kind of dumb down the 80-20 rule and basically say AI will do you know, a, a majority of the repetitive work. And then the 20% human beings will add unique value. Okay. So you know, will that AI hand crush human beings and all that stuff? I don't want to really go there. I think it's that point where we do the dialogue. And I think if we go back to the future, kind of like we have with Bayes, with John Henry, right? and now with Socrates, it's all about the dialogue between AI and the human, right? So the Socratic method, folks, is this. Uh, someone asks you a question, 
you give an answer. And as long as both parties are prepared, properly trained, and are able to contribute to the conversation, you continually refine your thought. And you can even go, you could argue it's in a circular, kind of an iterative circle going up. So that's the Socratic method. You ask questions, you refine your thoughts, you come up with kind of new premises. And so you you basically engage in a dialogue. And this is kind of the opposite, I think, of what people expect with cybersecurity. Well, AI will just do the fighting for us, or AI will do the thinking for us. Um, it, can, it probably can. I just don't think the result will be very positive or, or useful. I think if human beings and AI work together, now you're talking. So the AI is the beginning of thought and not the end of thought. It's the beginning of action and it can do some great things, but it's not the end all be all. So we need to take a deeper investigation into how you work with your AI coworker. And there, so there are practical models for understanding uh, AI and machine learning interaction, right? And practical, practical iteration and participation. Here's an example. Uh, Chris Cochran, two examples, actually. Chris Cochran, uh, he's a threat hunter, he used to be for the NSA, then he was over at Netflix. He's now working for Huntress Labs, right? And he's very interested in showing how this new 80-20 rule, as it were, it's not really the new rule, um, kind of where AI does some of the work and then humans do the unique, provide the unique value add. Uh, and both of these folks, Kat Self, or Katrina, I think is her name, but Kat is uh, an emulation engineer over at MITRE, right? They work with AI all the time. And both of them say have said versions of the same concept of artificial intelligence does the boring stuff that we don't want to do, right? That's one way to put it. I think what it really means is that, see, sorry, I'm having a uh, pause with my mouse, that we have to go to the last cybersecurity mile. And this means that we, we understand where the repetitive work stops and where the human interface starts. Now, businesses get this, right? They, they hope that it brings cost savings. And I find that really funny. You're gonna spend a whole lot of money saving money <laughs> when it comes to AI. It's kind of like, I'm old enough to remember when voice over IP, which we're doing right now, was gonna save tons of money. Well, they ended up spending much more money to get better services. And this is the key. It's wise investment rather than saving money. I don't think you're gonna save money. But see, it handles basic repetitive tasks. It can handle scale. It can personalize, that's fine. But the real challenges, of course, are, hey, it costs money to do this. And there are new cybersecurity risks. I would argue not so much because of the intrinsic nature of AI, but because of the intrinsic nature of IT departments that don't have very mature processes. Uh, so I think that's a serious problem. Yeah, we're lacking skilled workers. I don't think that means, personally, that when it comes to artificial intelligence, hey, we have to have you know, MIT geniuses to implement AI for our small business or our medium business or even our large business. That lack of skill has to do with the lack of cybersecurity skill and the foundational elements. Do you know your TCP handshake? Do you know how SSL or TLS works really? Do you know how HTTP works, those conversations? It's those kinds of skills and foundations that are very important. The concerns are usually, well, we don't know how AI is going to decide things, right? Now, that's probably not necessarily because AI is sinister, you know, there's some sort of Terminator in there coming to get you. I think the enemy there in many ways is us. If we feed improper processes into AI and get, we're going to get really improper responses, okay? So I think those worries there we need to think a little bit more about. So to bring it all together, folks. Our job is to focus on the three C's, to collect, crunch, and contextualize. AI will allow us to do that. Uh, we'll do 80% of the work, and then we do the rest of the 20% or less. So if you take a data set like Eternal Blue here, this is a packet capture, or a data set like a spreadsheet, right, that contains information about hacker pivots. This is a, uh, I was doing some pivot analysis of a, of a hacker, um, put it all into a spreadsheet, and I was able to do some find some interesting things. But the whole idea is that AI is gonna allow us to tame the three Vs. We all, I think we've all heard of variety, velocity, and volume, the three Vs, right? Um, it was a long time ago, I had a person talk to me saying, James, when it comes to cybersecurity, increasingly we deal with data sets. And, and that's what we really do deal with, right? And so we need to increase our ability to handle the speed, right? The difference, the variety, and the volume of it. Okay, and it'll do that. So the idea, is that as we apply 
our informational model where we get data feeds from the cloud, we get packet captures from Snort and Zuricata, okay? We curate that using artificial intelligence and we get pattern recognition going. It's not so much generative AI, it's the predictive AI that will help us to do visualization and tell a story. So that as we curate our cybersecurity information from CloudWatch and Sentinel or from AWS or Alibaba Cloud, uh, uh, Asia uses a lot of that, um, and our host intrusion detection devices, right, Waza or our intrusion detection devices, the idea is that we do that curation. That's where AI is going to fit in. So as we take those ugly log files and we visualize them, I did this manually. I, I took some log files in to something called the Elastic Stack. They used to call it the Elk Stack. Um, Elastic Search, Kibana, right, Logstash. Uh, this is a manual process where I was able to create a, a, a nice little table chart, nice little pie chart. Imagine AI being able to curate this much faster, and it can. Okay, it can. We still need a human being to, at certain points, but that point will increasingly shift left, right? That point will to, to where the human being contributes actionable information will be at a much more sophisticated and nuanced point than we had expected. That's the, the progress of AI, okay? So to finish up here, there are a lot of myth conceptions out there about AI. You know, uh, so many people, well, if it comes from AI, it must be right. Well, no, no, we need a human being to determine that right now. Uh, if AI learns, it will always improve. No, it just means it's going to learn, right? You know, as a child learns, does that child always improve? Not really. No one needs to train AI and machine learning. It just happens automatically. No, that's not the case. Real implementations are here. They've been here for 30 years. They're not three to five years away. Are better ones available three to five years away? Well, sure, right? Um, artificial intelligence will always replace human beings. Mm, no, not always. Artificial intelligence will never replace human beings. No, it, it will in many cases, okay? Uh, AI means you don't need to learn the foundations of IT, right? I think that's a myth. You need to learn the foundations. That doesn't mean that you need to, to just learn the basics and that's it. But if you don't have a proper foundation, you'll never be able to, to pull a John, uh, an anti-John Henry and think laterally and work in the Socratic method or take advantage of Bayes' algorithms. Uh, bias can be adjusted automatically. Uh-uh, human beings do that, okay? And when I'm talking about bias, yes, there's race, class, gender bias all the time, absolutely. But there's also bias in that some of those tools were created in a certain for a certain use. And as we reuse them, they have a bias that goes back to that old use. AI will kill all jobs. Uh, I don't think it's gonna kill all jobs. Uh, some people say AI won't kill very many jobs. So, oh no, it's gonna kill a lot of jobs right? It's going to morph them. Okay. And it's the, if we have a proper foundation, we can do, we can take advantage of that. Um, then people say, well, it's obvious where AI will work in an organization. It's just really obvious we can apply that. I don't think it's so obvious at all. It takes a lot of work to, to apply any new emerging technology into a business model. So here are a few resources to take a look at. Uh, there's a blog that was written up on the uh, CompTIA blog. Just You can Google for it or take a look at it here. I have these slides available for you. I'll get you a QR code in a minute. But if you want, you can join with me. Uh, you join in my, on my LinkedIn. I'd be happy to talk with you more about this. If you haven't started your own network, uh, please do so. I want to thank you very much for your time today. Uh, and I can uh, go ahead and answer some questions in the last uh, few minutes. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Here's a QR code where you can download the slides. If you don't trust QR codes, uh, then you can, uh, I guess, take a screenshot of that uh, really long and ugly URL, uh, and then you can download the slides as you wish. So uh, there's the QR code. I'll stop there and see if anybody uh, has any questions. Um, here we go. There's a question from Nirup. How you doing, man? Um, listening in from Grand Forks, North Dakota. How you doing? Uh, thank you for my talk. Okay, could I share my thoughts? on if and how balancing, let's see if I can put the question in here, AI models explainability will affect model performance for cybersecurity applications like threat intelligence. Good question. First of all, uh, when it, it comes to balancing explainability, right, will affect model performance. So when it comes to explainability, I think you're talking about the idea of, um, how should I put this? That you can that you know exactly what model that you're being transparent about the AI model being used. 
And I think what you're, you're happening here is that there, you really need to balance, you really need to weigh how, um, how an application uh, will be used. Let me see if I can explain that better. When it comes to um, taking uh, a, an AI model and, and, and analyzing, for example, an application programming interface, right? An API is like a, a a menu in a restaurant or even a server in a restaurant, right? The server, they'll come out and say, what do you want? And, and then you, you make a request and then they go back into the kitchen, right? So imagine when it comes to using an AI model, you need to be able to understand what that API is doing in a very detailed way. AI can't figure that out for you, right? You have to apply that. So I would argue that you need to have uh, somebody who knows that AI interest, uh, sorry, that API interest is very well. And that way, then you can do that modeling uh, much better. So to me, it really comes down to the IT person and that person and that technology, whether it be somebody creating uh, an AI uh, instance or taking an AI instance that's basically been productized, right, and mapping it to that specific application. That's where I would go with that answer. It, it really comes down to that dialogue between the AI instance, right? And what you want it to do and the problem that you want it to solve. So Nirup, there's my, there's my answer for, for that one. So thank you very much. Uh, there's uh, somebody anonymous is saying, what's your perspective on the jobs that'll be created? Uh, like AI. Yeah, I think prompt engineering is definitely one of those things. Um, I think it will balance it. I think what you're going to see, first of all, is uh, uh, certain job roles will still be called technical support or cybersecurity analyst or SOC analyst, right? I think those job titles will still be around. Just what exactly they do, right? The, the So the bottle will stay the same, but the contents, I think, will will change. I think one of the jobs that will be uh, happening more and more is that you will become, instead of a SOC analyst where you look at a log file or a pretty picture of some sort of uh, some sort of attack happening and then you drill in like that, AI will do that for you and it'll provide context. And so instead of you providing context for your boss, AI provides the context. And then what you need to do as a SOC analyst is say, I see what the AI is saying is happening and I concur with that or I don't concur with that. So you're gonna find SOC analysts will be much more, how should I put this? SOC modelers, right? Threat modelers, right? And they will be verifiers of information. And this kind of goes back to understanding of the foundations. Fairly recently, it was uh, uh, less than a year ago, I was asked to go in and do some uh, training for uh, NCSA Thailand, that's their incident responders. So I talked to a lot of people in the uh, uh, in their uh, cybersecurity analysts uh, in the in the army uh, and also uh, civilians, and they needed a lot of uh, improvement in foundational uh, technologies. They they really understood how to take data sets and things, but they didn't know a lot of things about HTTP, for example, uh, about buffer overflows. And I'm I'm picking on Thailand right now. Um, I can pick on the state of New Jersey because I had to give the same uh, training to people who work uh, regularly with the FBI and incident responders. They needed the same training in the U.S. Uh, I've done the same training in Singapore and also in London. So uh, it's not just Thailand, right? It's a lot of IT workers. And the reason why they all wanted this foundational work is they were implementing um, artificial intelligence more and more. And they said, we don't just need people to read log files or even uh, take a look at uh, what QRadar can do, right? Uh, AI is going to do that. So the new jobs are going to be much more along, aligned with the modeling of threats and also the training. I think you're going to see a lot more uh, you know, people who are, are, their job is to train AI. They'll come up with a new term for that right? Uh, new terms for that. But I think that's one of the jobs that's going to be around. Um, will that balance jobs that'll be replaced by AI? Yeah, I, I think so. I really do. Uh, um, there are no blacksmiths around anymore, right? You know, the people who work on horses. I shouldn't say no, there were very few. Um, but most of those became mechanics, didn't they, in cars, right? So uh, we'll see the same sort of thing. 
Thank you, James. I think you, you know, the talk was fantastic. I think you kind of fall semester starts and students are listening and a lot of reminders that you uh, brought into attention uh, about fun, how foundations of cybersecurity still matters. You yeah. know, AI needs human intervention. AI needs. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And I think I enjoyed uh, a lot of high level yet powerful uh, reminders in terms of uh, some of the terms that you talked about, startup moonshot mentality, you yeah. know, and yeah. uh, and so on. But I have a couple of questions. You know, sure. first being a CompTIA, being a certification provider in IT, and how do you see that uh, higher education institutions? Um, you know, uh, what are you hearing from industry uh, CEOs, and and what do we need to do? How we can leverage AI as a force multiplier in curricula? in cybersecurity or CS curricula. <clears throat> you know, Great. what are your advice? And, uh, and and students are listening. How do they prepare for certain tooling? Or I'm, I'm just curious to see what's your uh, thought process on this. Hands-on, practical. You What, what people, what a hiring manager is going to ask you to do uh, as a student, right, is to apply this stuff as much as possible. So as you learn about a new concept, whether it be a buffer overflow, go up and um, you know don't do it on somebody else's systems because you'll get arrested, but download VirtualBox and download Kali Linux and download a couple old versions of, Linux, of Windows and Linux and practice those things. AI will automate a lot of the things that we're talking about, or you can go up to the cloud and get that going. But what what worker, what employers are asking of workers is two things: strong foundations in uh, the protocols that I've talked about, from the TCP handshake to SSL TLS, uh, but a strong foundation in that, but also a practical implementation of it. They don't want theoreticians coming in. They want people to say, "Yeah, actually, I know what it means to go in and secure that database." A uh, uh, web server interstice or that interface between the two. Yeah, I know how to monitor that. I practically know how to use Q radar, not just to sit back and go, oh yeah, I'm going to drink my you know Diet Dr Pepper and let the machine do the work. You know, why would we need you? We need somebody who can say, oh, I see something that looks like it's slipping between the cracks because I have practical knowledge of something uh, of of attacks, and I can drill down in there and say that's a false positive. Don't worry about that. And I have practical knowledge to say, actually, this is a serious issue that I need to escalate and, and then problem solve. Because AI will show us the problems. Will AI go in and automatically fix the problems? That's the third thing. So from foundations to understanding how uh, hands-on and practical to get into the problem, and then knowing how to fix things. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see in the near future um, the ability of AI to go in and fix things automatically, you know, uh, bad, you know, IT business processes. Uh, that's another area where human beings are going to have to go in and do, I would call fix modeling, how to fix processes uh, in an IT department or in a business where technology is misapplied or, uh, or uh, insecurely provided. Uh, so we that, have uh, another question. Oh, yeah. um, okay. Will the Security Plus 701 exam launching November 7th have questions and domains related to AI slash ML assisted attacks and threats? There's not a specific domain uh, uh, list, listed on that, but what there are, there's, first of all, there are domains listed about what it means to uh, to look at attacks, right? And there is mention of, 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 of AI being used, but there's not an entire domain based on it just there there, uh, there if there are going to be questions on it it's going to be more uh you know you had input from a resource right uh and then you can evaluate that so anything that you'll get on the 701 exam will be based on uh you're getting input from a resource whether that be a packet capture or maybe ai but then it will ask you to interpret what that is and you'd, be, you'd have to look at it and go oh that is a packet capture of a buffer overflow or something like that. So uh, you'll see more practical things than uh, than talking about AI assisted attacks. No, you know, um, related to exams, you know, from uh, for students who are in BS in computer science or BS in cybersecurity, you know, um, 
do you recommend any types of your certification courses, you know, anything that needs to be integrated into the curriculum, or maybe they need to take this and that? Do you have any advice on that? I'm not sure what other universities are even doing that, you know, and but I think it's just probably mostly optional for people who want to get some entry level jobs in IT. But uh, I just want to ask as we want to build a robust curriculum, and uh, there are so many. Um, types of certifications out there, you know, and, you know, I'm just curious to see what uh, you have to say on that. A couple of things, and, and let me make sure I'll give a quick answer. And 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 uh, so I'm going to ask you a question back here. So you're talking, you're asking you know, from a curriculum perspective, what are some of the things that would be really good to add to make sure that colleges provide the right foundation? Is that what you're asking? Or we, mm -hmm, have, mm -hmm. okay. we have so many certification providers, you know, like DC yeah. Council offers so many things, GOMTA offers exams, and then there are many other organizations offer a lot of uh, pen testing, ethical hacking, and different types right. of courses. And uh, while we do teach them, you know, in, in the courses, you know, but I was just curious to see, you know, uh, for students to get an edge on getting a job offer and and go, getting to uh, have this additional value to one or two certifications, if so, what that may look like for an undergraduate, you know. Great, thank you for asking that. Uh, there are two things I'll bring up. First of all, um, there was a uh, there's a guy I know. His name is Mike Garrity. He's the CISO uh, for the state of New Jersey. Great guy. And he once said, "I wish I'd have thought of it." Uh, he once said, "You can't protect a network." unless you know how networks work. Now, my point is from a foundational level, um, a lot of people really want to stampede into security analytics or pen testing or something like that. Take a step back. Do you really understand your protocols? HTTP, do you, you know, for example, do you really understand how those protocols work? Because that's really in many ways where the action is. You could argue hackers are in applications, right? They're, and I'm talking about applications, not just on your mobile phone, but you know, web server side applications or serverless applications, right? Because that's where the users are, that's where the money is. So you need to have uh, those foundations. So as far from a curriculum perspective, be careful in not giving the right foundation. Everybody knows, or most people know the A plus, network plus, security plus kind of trifecta. The reason why that pathway exists is because it gives the right foundation. A plus doesn't necessarily just teach help desk, it teaches endpoints, right? MAC addresses, right? How all that works, you know, how does DNS really work? So you're talking A plus network plus, for example. So I, I think from a curriculum perspective, yeah, there are a lot of great certifications and training programs out there, but what are you doing to offer a pathway that allows students to join and learn from a practical level where their level is, and then you bring them up to your level, right? I think there's, there's been too much of a rush to get people past all that boring stuff to get to the fun stuff. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, again, it was uh, AstraZeneca, his name is Robert Venier. He's in charge of all data center and cloud implementations for AstraZeneca. And he once uh, told me that cloud offerings change about every three weeks. And he said they change radically, substantively. And I'm like, well, how do you train every three weeks changes, you know, forget the 18 months changes or it's every three weeks. And he said, well, if you have your foundation down, you can keep your feet with those changes. I'm like, well, that's, that's smart. That's a cloud smart kind of attitude. So there's that. I think, so offering a pathway and focusing on customizing that learning so that students are brought along in a practical way for the foundations. The second thing I really want to hit though, applying the technology to a business goal. Every hiring manager I know, they're desperate for, uh, for, for workers and, and, and universities and learning centers, uh, everybody, we're churning out, trying to churn out lots of, of cybersecurity workers and IT workers. But I think hiring managers are not seeing evidence that, hey, this person, they know how to map cybersecurity or an IT technical solution to a business goal. Right. So it's, that's really important. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, we're going to conclude this webinar, but I okay. think I see one question here. Let's just see whether the last question, training AI itself is a time-consuming task. How much more time would need to be invested in test, be, in tested before deployment and make a shift from being black box? Are these any suggested testing methodologies other oh, than man, normal? That's a 
Great question. Uh, I'll try to make the answer short because we're over time. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, if we can do it in uh, one minute, and that's do that. Great. I'll do it. I try to do it in thirty seconds. Uh, first of all, iteration is important. Second of all, um, uh, my analogy for that is uh, I'll buy. Uh, I'll buy the boat if you maintain it. Right. <laughs> in other words, everybody wants to go out and buy a boat, but they never want to maintain it. And boat stands for uh, breakout, bringing out another thousand. I'm coming up with this analogy about boats and artificial intelligence. There are a lot of companies that have in the last few years implemented artificial intelligence. They they never thought about or had an appetite for training it or retraining it and maintaining it. Uh, to your point, I, I you have to, the testing and deployment is very important, but the suggested testing methodology, first of all, is making sure your business actually has an appetite for doing testing and training because they, they they just think, oh, mission accomplished, AI is out there. And that's just the beginning of it. So uh, the, the train test split, I think is a real problem, mainly because organizations don't have the appetite to maintain and train the AI that they've already put in because they're moving on to something else. That's not a very mature process. That's that's the problem with AI, you could argue. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. James. I appreciate your time today. I think in for your uh, contribution to this webinar, you know, we will send you a nice plaque and uh, oh, we need your mailing you. address and a nice certificate signed by our Dean. And we will oh, also wow. make the recording available on our YouTube, uh, um, channel and Correct. we will send you the link as well so you could uh, you could also have a chance to share uh, this webinar with your uh, networks but I think uh, thank you so much I think this has been a great learning experience and also to as I don't know you pointed a lot of reminders that is going to be useful for our audience and uh, sure. and uh, let's keep in touch let's keep in touch thank you so much everyone take care bye-bye thank you